Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is the 23rd of the 11th month on our Creator's calendar. On the Gregorian calendar, it is the 5th of the second month, which they call February. And we are continuing in our study of the Book of the Recognitions of Clement. Last time we went on a little digression because this book, the translation that we have from Jackson Snyder, and really the translation that came from the Greek and Latin, all of them is missing 10 chapters from book three. If you remember, we talked about that and went over it last week. So this is continuing on book three, chapter 12. And this is after he had his morning discussion or pre-dawn discussion with his taught ones, refuting the idea of the Trinity and explaining who in in a manner that was not harmful, the identity of the Father, our Mashiach, and the set-apart Ruach. So without further ado, this is chapter 12, second day's discussion. But when the day or Yom had dawned, someone came in and said, there is a very great multitude waiting in the court, and in the midst of them stands Shimon, endeavoring to preoccupy the ears of the people with most immoral persu persuasions. Then Kepha, immediately going out, stood in the place where he had disputed the day before, and all the people turning to him with joy gave heed to him. But when Shimon perceived that the people rejoiced at the sight of Kepha and were moved to love him, he said in confusion, I wonder at the folly of men who call me a magician and love Kepha, whereas having knowledge of me of old, they ought to love me rather. And therefore, from this sign, those who have sense may comprehend that Kepha may rather seem to be the magician, since affection is not born to me, to whom it is almost due from acquaintance, but is abundantly expended upon him to whom it is not due by any familiarity. While Shimon was thus talking on in this style, Kepha having saluted the people in his usual manner, or sorry, usual way, thus answered, O Shimon, his own conscience is sufficient for everyone to confute him. But if you wonder at this, that those who are acquainted with you not only not not only do not love you, but even hate you, learn the reason from me. Since you are a seducer, the same as the serpent in the garden, and the same that Moshe said, do not be seduced to the people, right? Since you are a seducer, you profess to proclaim the truth. And on this account, you had many friends, Havarim, who had a desire to learn the truth. But when they saw in you things contrary to what you professed, they being, as I said, lovers of truth, began not only not to love you, but even to hate you. But yet they did not immediately forsake you, because you still promised that you could show them what is true. As long, therefore, as no one was present who could show them, they bore with you. But since the expectation of better instruction has drawn them upon, or has dawned upon them, sorry, they despise you and seek to know what they comprehend to be better. And you, indeed, acting by nefarious arts, thought at first that you should escape detection. But you are detected. For you are driven into a corner, and contrary to your expectation, you are made notorious, not only as being ignorant of the truth, but as being unwilling to hear it from those who know it. For if you had been willing to hear, that saying would have been exemplified in you of him who said that there is nothing hidden that will not be known, nor covered that will not be disclosed. 
While Kepha spoke these words and others to the same effect, Shimon answered, I will not have you to detain me with long speeches, Kepha. I claim from you what you promised yesterday. You then said that you could show that Torah teaches concerning immensity of the ageless light. And that there is sorry, and that there are only two Shemaim, and these created, and that the higher is the abode of that light in which the ineffable Father dwells alone forever. But after that, the pattern of that Shemaim is made, this visible sky or firmament, which you asserted is to pass away. You said, therefore, that the Father of all is one, because there cannot be two infinities, else neither of them would be infinite, because in that in which the one subsists, he makes a limit of the substance of the other. Since then, you do, or you not only promise this, but are able to show it from Torah, leave off other matters and set about this. Then Kepha said, If I were asked to speak of these things only on your account, who come only for the purpose of contradicting, you should never hear a single discourse from me. But seeing it is necessary that the husbandmen, wishing to sow good ground, should sow some seeds either in stony places, or places that are to be trodden of men, or in places filled with brambles and briars, as our master also set forth, indicating by these the diversities of the purposes of the several Ruach Oath or spirits, I will not delay. So you see, he has the injunction not to throw his pearls before swine, but he also has the injunction here that when you sow the seed, it, there's going to be different kinds that receive it. And so for the people there, for the sake of their benefit, he's going to explain the things that are being discussed there. But he puts it in such a way that Shimon, again, isn't able to comprehend unless he repents of the things that he's doing wrong. This is chapter 15, Shimon's arrogance. It says, Then said Shimon, You seem to me to be angry, but if it be so... It is not necessary to enter into the conflict. Then Kepha, I see that you perceive that you are to be convicted, and you desire politely to escape from the contest. For what have you seen to have made me angry against you, a man desiring to deceive so great a multitude? And when you have nothing to say, pretending moderation, who also command forsooth by your authority, that the controversy will be conducted as you please, and not as order demands. Then Shimon, I will enforce myself to bear patiently your unskillfulness, that I may show that you indeed desire to seduce the people, but that I teach the truth. But now I refrain from a discussion concerning that boundless light. Answer me, therefore, what I ask of you. Since Yahuwah, as you say, made all things, whence comes evil? Then said Kepha, To put questions in this way is not the part of an opponent, but of a learner. If therefore you desire to learn, confess it, and I will first teach you how you ought to learn. And when you have learned to listen, then straight away I will begin to teach you. But if you do not desire to learn as though you knew all things, I will first set forth the belief that I preach, and do you also set forth what you think to be true? And when the profession of each of us has been disclosed, let our hearers judge whose discourse is supported by truth. To this, Shimon answered, This is a good joke. Behold a fellow who offers to teach me. Nevertheless, I will suffer you and bear with your ignorance and your arrogance. I confess then, I do desire to learn. Let us see how you can teach me.
Then Ketha said, and I want you to pay attention, the, the mannerisms between the two, the characteristics. One has the mannerisms of our Mashiach, and one has the mannerisms that are antagonistic or adversarial, what we can call satanic, right? And the more you study about the two Ruach Oath or the two spirits, the two kings that rule over all men in this world, Malki Zadok or Malki Rasha, the king of righteousness or the king of evil, one's a title for our Mashiach and the other is a title for Satan directly from the teaching on the two Ruach Oath and the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? But And that's also from the visions of Amram and other places the shepherd of her mass, the epistle of Barnabas, the apostolate constitutions. It's literally all over. Even in the testaments of the 12 patriarchs, it talks about the two Ruach oath of the two influences over every man. And it's whichever one you choose to serve, right? This is then Kepha said, if you truly desire to learn, first learn this, how unskillfully you have framed your question. For you say, since Yahuwah has created all things, whence is evil? But before you ask this, three sorts of questions should have been should have had the precedence. So three things should have came first. First, whether there be evil. Secondly, what is e or what evil is, rather. Thirdly, to whom it is and whence. To this, Shimon answered, O oh, you most unskillful and unlearned, is there any man who does not confess that there is evil in this life? Whence I also, thinking that you had even the common sense of all men, asked whence evil is, not as desiring to learn, since I know all things, least of all from you who know nothing but that I might show you to be ignorant of all things, and that you may not suppose that it is because I am angry that I speak somewhat sternly. Know that I am moved with compassion for those who are present, whom you are attempting to deceive. Then Kepha said, The more immoral are you if you can do such wrong, not being angry. But smoke must rise where there is fire. Nevertheless, I will tell you, lest I should seem to take you up with words, so as not to answer to those things that you have spoken disorderly. You say that all confess the existence of evil, which is verily false. For first of all, the whole Hebrew tribe denies its existence. Then Shimon, interrupting his discourse, said, they do rightly who say that there is no evil? Then Kepha answered, We do not propose to speak of this now, but only to state the fact that the existence of evil is not universally admitted. But the second question that you should have asked is, What is evil? A substance, an accident, or an act? and many other things of the same sort. And after that, towards what and how it is, or to whom it is evil, whether to Yahuwah or to Malachim, messengers, or to men, or to the righteous or the immoral, to all or to some, to one's self or to no one. And then you should inquire, whence is it? whether from Yahuwah or from nothing, whether it has always been or has had its beginning in time, whether it is useful or useless, and many other things that a preposition of this sort demands. To this, Shimon answered, pardon me, I was in error concerning the first question, but suppose that I now ask first whether evil is or not. Then Kepha said, in what way do you put the question, as desiring to learn or to teach, or for the sake of raising the question? For if indeed, as desiring to learn, I have something to teach you first, 
that coming by consequence and the right order of doctrine, you may comprehend from yourself what evil is. But if you put the question as an instructor, I have no need to be taught by you, for I have a master from whom I have learned all things. And this is something that Kepha will later explain. We can fatally lose our deliverance after immersion by having another teacher other than Yahuwah Yahushua. So it's something to keep in mind. It says, but if you ask merely for the sake of raising a question and disputing, let each of us first set forth his opinion. And so let the matter be debated, for it is not reasonable that you should ask as someone or as one desiring to learn and contradict as one teaching, so that after my answer it should be in your discretion to say whether I have spoken well or ill. So you cannot stand in the place of a gainsayer and be judge of what we say. And therefore I said, if a discussion is to be held, let each of us state his sentiments and while we are placed in conflict, these attentive hearers will be right judges or right shofetim. Then Shimon said, Does it not seem to you to be absurd that an unskilled people should sit in judgment upon our sayings? Then Kepha, it is not so. Now you remember just not to get too sidetracked, but Shimon, the magician, at the beginning of this discussion, when he was talking about what he was going to use to dispute the truth, whether the, the Torah of the Yahudim or some other writings or something else, and he had said that there is no other authority for what is true or what to base things on but the Torah, and that everyone has to comprehend it from his own judgment. So it, it can't be just believing what another tells you to think. It has to be judging for yourself what is true based on what is written. So the idea that Kef is putting forward is put your forth your stated opinions in debate and let the people decide what is true is staying in line with right reason and truth going together, letting every man decide at the bar of his own judgment what is right and true. But it says, for what is less clear to one can be investigated by many, for oftentimes even a popular rumor has the aspect of a foretelling. But in addition to all this, all these people stand here constrained by the love of Yahuwah and by a desire to know the truth. And therefore, all these are to be regarded as one by reason of their affection being one and the same towards the truth. As, on the other hand, two are many and diverse, if they disagree with each other. But if you desire to receive an indication how all these people who stand before us are as one man, consider from their very silence and quietness, how, with all patience, as you see, they do honor to the truth of Elohim, even before they learn it. For they have not yet learned the greater observance that they owe to it. So I expect through the mercy or chesed, which is the loving kindness of Yahuwah, that he will accept the obedient purpose of their intent or of their mind towards him and will give the palm of victory to him who preaches the truth. And that mention of palms is important. Every mention of when it has a palm talks about this time. And if you remember, they had the palm branches and their garments, their outer garments, they were laying down on the way as Yahuwah Yahushua was making his way towards Yahushalayim on the donkey and the colt. So all foretelling you know, things are happening there. But the palm branches for victory were also alluded to in the book of Gad the Seer, chapter 1 with the vision that Gad had of our Mashiach 
coming out of the sun, the, the lamb despised and rejected. And it also included the song of the lamb, right? So all these things tied together. But it says, and will give the palm of victory to him who preaches the truth that he may make manifest to them the herald of truth. Chapter 20, Common Principles, it says, Then Shimon, on what subject do you desire the discussion to be held? Tell me that I also may define what I think. And so the inquiry may begin. And Kepha answered, If indeed you will do as I think right, I would have it done according to the precept of my master who first of all commanded the Hebrew tribe, whom he knew to have knowledge of Yahuwah, and that it is he who made the world, not that they should inquire about him whom they knew, but that knowing him, they should investigate his will and his righteousness, because it is placed in men's power that searching into these things, they may find and do and observe those things concerning that they are to be judged. Therefore, he commanded us to inquire, not whence evil comes, as you just or as you asked just now, but to seek the righteousness of Yahuwah and his kingdom. And all these things, says he, will be added to you. Then Shimon said, Since these things are commanded to Hebrews, as having a right knowledge of Yahuwah, and being of opinion that everyone has it in his power to do these things concerning that he is to be judged. But my opinion differs from theirs. Where do you desire me to begin? And here's a very, 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 very important topic. Okay, the freedom, the liberty, the freedom of our will, the ability to do right or wrong. Okay? The messengers even have a choice. They choose right because they saw what would happen if they choose contrary, right? But it says, then said Kepha, I advise that the first inquiry be whether it is in our power to know whence we are to be judged. But Shimon said, not so, but concerning Yahuwah about whom all who are present are desirous to hear. Then Kepha, I just want to point out, you can see Shimon's not trying to have a meaningful discussion. He's constantly trying to, to trip up Kepha. He's trying to keep him on his toes and not do his thing and adjust it so he can try to win. It's not about discerning what's true. It's about trying to defeat your enemy, which is why it's not, it's not working out so well for him. But Shimon said, not so, but concerning Yahuwah, about whom all who are present are desirous to hear. Then Kepha, you admit then that something is in the power of the will. Only confess this, if it is so, and let us inquire as you say concerning Yahuwah. To this, Shimon answered, by no means. Then said Kepha, if then nothing is in our power, it is useless for us to inquire anything concerning Yahuwah, since it is not in the power of those who seek to find. Hence I said well that this should be the first inquiry, whether anything is in the power of the will. Then said Shimon, We cannot even comprehend this that you say, if there is anything in the power of the will. But Kepha, seeing that he was turning to contention, and through fear of being overcome, was confounding all things as being in general uncertain, answered, How then do you know that it is not in the power of man to know anything, since this very thing at least you know? Then Shimon said, I know not whether I know even this. For everyone according as it is decreed to him by fate, either does or comprehends or suffers. Then Kepha said, See, my brothers, into what absurdities Shimon has fallen, who before my coming was teaching that men have in their power 
to be wise and to do what they will. But now, driven into a corner by the force of my arguments, he denies that man has any power, either of perceiving or of acting. And yet he presumes to profess himself to be a teacher. Yet tell me how then Yahuwah judges according to truth every one for his doings, if men have it not in their own power to do anything. If this opinion be held, all things are torn up by the roots. Vain will be the desire of following after goodness. Yea, even in vain do the shofatim, or judges of the world, administer laws and punish those who do amiss. For they had it not in their power not to sin. Vain also will be laws of tribes that assign penalties to evil deeds. Miserable also will those be who laboriously keep righteousness. But Baruch, those who, living in pleasure, exercise tyranny, living in luxury and immorality. According to this, therefore, there can be neither righteousness, nor goodness, nor any virtue, nor, as you would have it, any Elohim. But, Shimon, I know why you have spoken thus, truly because you desired to avoid inquiry, lest you should be openly confuted. And therefore, you say that it is not in the power of man to perceive or to discern anything. But if this had really been your opinion, you would not, surely, before my coming, have professed yourself before the people to be a teacher. I say, therefore, that man is under his own control. Then said Shimon, What is the meaning of being under his own control? Tell us. To this kepha, if nothing can be learned, why do you desire to hear? And Shimon said, you have nothing to answer to this. Then said kepha, I will speak, not as under compulsion from you, but at the request of the hearers. The power of choice is the sense of the ruach, possessing a quality by which it can be inclined towards what acts it wills. Then Shimon, applauding Kepha for what he had spoken, said, Truly you have expounded it magnificently and incomparably, for it is my duty to bear testimony to your speaking well. Now if you will explain to me that or this that I now ask you, in all things else I will submit to you. But what I wish to learn then is this. If what Elohim wishes to be is, and what he does not wish to be is not, answer me this. Then, Kepha, if you do not know that you are asking an absurd and incompetent question, I will pardon you and explain. But if you are aware that you are asking inconsequently, you do not well. Then Shimon said, I swear by the supreme Elohim, or mighty one, whatsoever that may be, which judges and punishes those who sin, that I know not what I have said inconsequently, or what absurdity there is in my words, that is, in those that I have just uttered. And this is chapter 24, Yahuwah, the author of good, not of evil. And I know you have some parts in scripture where it says that he creates good and forms evil. It mentions these things. And here's the proper context for that. Yahuwah of himself did not form evil. It wasn't his tension from the beginning. It was only introduced because men or someone manifested it contrary to his will, which is what's explained right here. If I might add there, sin is the consequence of free will and moral being yes sir absolutely and then he goes on to explain what he means here too but ideally or essentially because there's free will there's the ability to do contrary to the one who made you and because you can go contrary there's consequences for those actions to correct you 
that's essentially what is going on. It's not just just free will. Uh, a gorilla has free will, but he has no moral center. The moral is required to have. I'm sorry, brother, you're cutting off. I, re I can't hear you anymore. I said that free will it is my, my little puppy dog has free will it's limited to his canine ability. But what is required for sin to be or righteousness to be is a moral center. And that's all stop. Thank you, brother. So this is chapter 24. It says, to this Kepha answer, since then you confess that you are ignorant, now learn. Your question demanded our deliverance on two matters that are contrary to one another. For every motion is divided into two parts, so that a certain part is moved by necessity and another by will. And those things that are moved by necessity are always in motion. Those that are moved by will, not always. For example, the sun's motion is performed by necessity to complete its appointed circuit. And every state and service of Shamayim depends upon necessary motions. But man directs the voluntary motions of his own actions. And thus there are some things that have been created for this end, that in their services they should be subject to necessity and should be unable to do aught else than what has been assigned to them. And when they have accomplished this service, the creator of all things, who thus arranged them according to his will, preserves them. But there are other things in which there is a power of will, and that have a free choice of doing what they will. These, as I have said, do not remain always in that order in which they were created, but according as their will leads them, and the judgment of their mind inclines them, they affect either good or evil, and therefore he has prospered, or he has proposed rewards to those who do well, and penalties to those who do evil. You say, therefore, if Yahuwah desires anything to be, it is, and if he does not desire it, it is not. But if I were to answer that what he desires is, and what he desires not is not, you would say that then he desires the evil things to be done that are done in the world, since everything that he desires is, and everything that he desires not is not. But if I had answered that it is not so that what Yahuwah desires is, and what he desires not is not, then you would retort upon me that Yahuwah must be powerless if he cannot do what he wills. And you would be all the more pertinent as thinking that you had got a victory though had said nothing to the point. Therefore you are ignorant, O Shimon, yea, very ignorant, how the will of Yahuwah acts in each individual case. For some things, as we have said, he has so willed to be that they cannot be otherwise than as they are ordained by him. And to these he has assigned neither rewards nor punishments. But those that he has willed to be so, that they have it in their power to do what they will. He has assigned to them according to their actions and their wills to earn either rewards or punishments. Since therefore, as I have informed you, all things that are moved are divided into two parts. According to the distinction that I formerly stated, everything that Yahuwah wills is, and everything that he wills not is not. To this, Shimon answered, <clears throat> was not he able to make us all such that we should be tov or good 
and that we should not have it in our power to be otherwise. Ketha answered, This also is an absurd question. For if he had made us of an unchangeable nature, and incapable of being moved away from Tob or good, we should not be really good, because we could not be aught else. And it would not be of our purpose that we were good. And what we yeah, and what we did not, or and what we did would not be ours, but of the necessity of our nature. But how can that be called good, which is not done of purpose? And on this account, the world required long periods until the number of the Ruach Oath or spirits that were predestined to fill it should be completed. And then that firmament or visible sky should be folded up like a scroll. And that which is higher should appear. And the Ruach Oath of the Baruch or blessed being restored to their bodies should be ushered into light. But the Ruach Oath, or spirits of the immoral, for their impure actions, being surrounded with fiery Ruach, should be plunged into the abyss of unquenchable fire, to endure punishments through eternity. Now that these things are so, Yahushua has testified to us, concerning whom, if you desire to know that he is a foreteller, I will instruct you by innumerable or innumerable declarations. For of those things that were spoken by him, even now everything that he said is being fulfilled. And those things that he spoke with respect to the future are believed to be about to, to be fulfilled. For belief is given to the future from those things that have already come to pass. And he reiterates about the firmament and the passing away of the, the firmament that we see in second Ketha. So it's something that's mentioned by him in the common scriptures as well. But what we're about to read is his details on why and why it's important to have an accurate comprehension of the things created as he said in his word and not as men say, this is about who's your teacher, right? And Ketha mentions explicitly you can fatally ruin your belief, your seal after immersion, by having a separate or a different teacher other than our Mashiach. But right here, this is chapter 27. I'm sorry, someone had something to say? Yeah, it seems to me that we've dipped into the well of uh, um, philosophy as much as theology at this point. I don't know what you mean. Those are never words that Kefa uses. He's just speaking the truth that he was instructed to. So I, I try to go by what, what they say. But what do you mean by that, brother? Well, to, if we simply try to explain good and evil and the presence of good and evil, uh, that, that tends to get into uh, philosophical areas. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It, it's just that we we approach it differently than we would say uh, plain mechanics. Okay, I'm 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 kind of I might have lost everybody. Some people have a natural ability, as we've been reading, for uh, uh, certain areas of of learning or uh, operating. Other people, uh, yourself, Richard, uh, you're tremendous at uh, uh, taking mass information and putting it all in, its, in the right place so we can properly understand it. Uh, I tend to be a little more philosophical and, and I'm not so much on precise words, but as in entire concepts. And I think that what you just covered was probably one of the best I've ever heard of covering the idea of good and evil. I just thought I'd mention that it, it's also philosophical. Thank you, brother, for sharing that. See, I, I, now I know what you're saying. So, okay, I can appreciate that better. Thank you.
and you'll find that's just like what Sha uh, Shaul or Paul Paul says in his epistle that he speaks hokma to those who are perfect. It, it doesn't mean that there isn't hokma throughout the word, but when you're walking correctly and you're humbly obedient to your maker, as Kefa explains, he knows the minds of all men. He makes himself available for your benefit. And he is knowledge, intelligence, hokma, cleverness, foresight, insight. The, the things that it mentions in Psalm or Proverbs chapter 8 and the other places concerning our Mashiach, right? And that's the word that indwells in man, the truth that's supposed to be in, in the position of our head, right? All these things are meant to teach us. <laughs> but um, like you were saying, you can find in a massive amount of information, a massive amount of philosophy or wisdom, in, hidden insights in these things when you take the time to think upon them. When you, when you study or read and you, you think upon his words, you see how they all come together. It's pretty amazing. I always learn something and it's always unique. It's, it's, it's never just random or, or um, sorry, it's never just a non-meaningful experience anytime I open scripture now. I'm always seeing something amazing and it's because the conditions are met for it. But when you're acting contrary, that doesn't happen. So it, his words are really true is the whole point. And Kefa goes on to explain later on that to have the same ability that he did to be able to cast out demons and have miracles at his word and have them flee from his mere presence, you just had to have the same disposition and innocence of life. So it, it's not something that's because our creator doesn't play favorites. But thank you for sharing, brother. This part right here, like I said, really amazing. And it's all about the importance of having a right concept of the creation based on what, is, what his word tells us and proving it through reason and not holding to something else. It's explained in another writing I don't want to get into right now. But the idea is you can't know someone you know someone by their works what how do you know any famous artist or general or writer you know them by what they've done by their works and words but if you have a perverted view of what those are then you don't have a right concept of the one that you're thinking of and so that's essentially what is taught here as well that i just want to make one essentially what the devil go ahead earl just uh, go ahead i'm i'm sorry i didn't mean no that's a problem i wanted to just go i just wanted to uh backtrack for a, a bit there about uh having a, no other teachers um i'm just trying to uh wrap my mind around that one i mean teachers from like if i'm going to go to a, a reiki teacher or something like that or uh or a, or a buddhist is that is that uh is, that's in the line of not having another teacher oh brother we're not supposed to have anyone as our teacher for the truth but the word of elohim that's come down from above all right and i'm also so i and i i did that i i, I kind of made of a, a real drastic example um but more of a plain vanilla kind of like you know if we're uh learning a new skill or something like that that really doesn't have anything to truth that's that, that's not what that means right no, if you're if they're trying to tell you something that's foundational about how reality works, then you you everything that you yeah. take from someone's teaching, you, you bring it to what the word says and mm -hmm. you you see whether or not it's real. But that's the foundation. You always go to him as the plumb line standard for what reality is. And he's right. your teacher in those things. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I run across different, you know, the uh, uh, psychology books here and there that, uh, you know, evaluate the mind. And I always tell myself, you know, if I read this, I'm going to take what I learned here and, and put it in the light of scripture and, and, and what, what Yahushua says to see if it's in, line, in alignment, because they might have a, a mechanic or something, something that, that can help, you know, but, but as long as it's not contrary to the word. So that, that, that's essentially... Uh, I guess what I'm looking at is if, if, if some of these practices I've had from the last couple of decades, uh, I, I don't, I'm want to wean out the ones that are there that are not edifying to Yahushua and we, and, and, uh, and, and just stick with what the word says. 
I don't know if that made sense. No, I, I perfectly agree with you. I'll show you again. Uh, in the Apostolic Constitutions, there's a couple places, but right there in the Commandments for Men, it talks about what's what's beneficial for you to read and to think upon. I, I can't speak about the philosophy or whatever books you're doing. The intent, though, if you need to learn how to change the oil in your car and you're reading the manual for it, that there's <laughs> nothing wrong with getting that and following those rules, right? Right. If you're trying to figure out how the mind of a man works, you, you want to go with what his word says over any opinions of men. But that's a, I don't know what you're on to or anything, but I'll let you read what it says there and you'll, you'll see. And then okay. you have to let, you have to let him lead you. If you feel like it's something you shouldn't do, don't because everything that's not in belief is sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, that's scripture. And that's the easy way to find out if you have a guilty, if you don't know, don't do it. And that will save you problems. You'll find out later whether or not it is or is not permissible, you know, it for certain. And then you can walk in belief and it won't be attributed as sin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. I'll share that with you. Yes, brother. You had a comment too. If I might. Yeah. We acquire information from multitudes of sources. And depending upon what the information is directed towards, what is our ultimate goal? If it's for truth, then it all has to be weighed against the, the word, that which is truth. Uh, but we learn it. We get the information from all sorts of areas. Does that help at all? Yeah, absolutely, Earl. Uh, that makes sense. You, you said exactly what I was uh, trying to get across. Yep. All right. <clears throat> So thank you all for sharing. I, I always think it's better off when we have edifying conversation about this stuff. So please feel free if you have any more as we go. This Richard, right could I, uh, in that chapter, see, it's 1026, uh, would perhaps be the sub best as a subject for a general discussion uh, to let each, each, you know, take a, an hour sometime and just go over that and explain it and, and with banty it back and forth until everybody gets a really good grasp. Because that really is an outstanding understanding of good and evil. Sounds like a plan. Perhaps we could do that uh, this week when we, when we do the Zoom meeting, if everyone's agreeable. You take the time during the week to think about it and come to the discussion ready. Absolutely. All right. All right. So right here, we'll, we'll try to get through. And I think we have plenty of time, but very important. Another foundational thing that Kef is trying to teach right here. If you, if you pay attention, <clears throat> I forgot real quick one. There we go. Make it a little easier for some to read. And this is chapter 27, the visible sky or the firmament, why made? But Shimon, perceiving that Kepha was clearly assigning a reason from the head of foretelling, from which the whole question is settled, declined that the discourse should take this turn, and thus answered, Give me an answer to the questions that I put, and tell me, if that visible sky is, as you say, to be dissolved, why was it made at first? Kepha answered, It was made for the sake of this present life of men, that there might be some sort of interposition and separation. Least any unworthy one might see the habitation of the celestials and the abode of Yahuwah himself which are prepared in order to be seen by those only who are of pure heart. But now that is in time of the, or, but now that is in the time of the conflict, it has pleased him that those things be invisible, which are destined as a reward to the conquerors. Then Shimon said, if the creator is good and the world is good, how will he who is good ever destroy that which is good? But if he will destroy that which is good, how will he himself be thought to be good? 
But if he will dissolve and destroy it as evil, how will he not appear to be evil? Who has made that which is evil? To this, Ketha replied, Since we have promised not to run away from your blasphemies, we endure them patiently. For you will yourself render an account for the things that you speak. Listen now, therefore, if indeed that Shemaim that is visible and transient had been made for its own sake, there would have been some reason in what you say that it ought not to be dissolved. But if it was made not for its own sake, but for the sake of something else, it must of necessity be dissolved, that that for which it seems to have been made may appear. As I might say by way of illustration, However fairly and carefully the shell of an egg may seem to have been formed, it is yet necessary that it be broken and opened, that the chick may issue from it, and that may appear from which the form of the whole egg seems to have been molded. So also, therefore, it is necessary that the condition of this world pass away, that that more joyous condition of the Shamayim Malkuth or the heavenly kingdom, may shine forth. Amen. Then Shimon, it does not seem to me that the Shamayim, which has been made by Elohim, can be dissolved. For things made by the eternal one are ageless, while things made by a corruptible one are temporary and decaying. Then Ketha, it is not so, Indeed, corruptible and temporary things of all sorts are made by mortal creatures, but the eternal does not always make things corruptible or always incorruptible. But according to the will of Elohim, the creator, so will be the things that he creates. For the power of Elohim is not subject to instruction, but his will is Torah to his creatures, which Torah means instruction. We translate it as law, and today, in common vernacular, it's known as the common law, if you want to be specific, which is the literal law of the country that we live in for America, also Great Britain, Australia, and a few other places in the world. And it is that system of government, which is that stone kingdom that's going to grow until it, it destroys all the kingdoms of the world when he returns and then it will not yield its sovereignty to another. It says, then Shimon answered, I call back to the first question, or I call you back to the first question. You said now that Elohim is visible to no one, but when that Shamayim will be dissolved and that superior condition of the Shamayim Malkuth will shine forth, then those who are pure in heart will see Yahuwah which they're, they're speaking of the Father, which statement is contrary to Torah, for there it is written that Yahuwah said, none will see my face and live. And here's another very interesting explanation to Ke for Kepha, right? Which you can see another witness of this in the book of Hanok, also in the common scriptures with Eliyahu being taken, and in the hidden writings, Baruch, Ezra, they're both taken. And then there's also in the writings called the Odes of Solomon, which were written by a New Testament Gentile believer. He was taken into the Shamayim and changed into the messenger and sing, sing praises before the Father. So these things are shown in different ways, right? But the pure in heart get to see him and not in the body that they have now. But then Kepha answered, To those who do not read Torah according to the tradition of Moshe, my speech appears to be contrary to it. But I will show you how it is not contradictory. Yahuwah is seen by the mind, not by the body, by the Ruach, not by the flesh. Whence also messengers who are Ruach oath or spirits see Yahuwah. And therefore men, as long as they are men, cannot see him. 
But after the resurrection of the dead, when they will have been made like the messengers, they will be able to see Yahuwah. And thus my statement is not contrary to Torah. Neither is that which our master said, Baruch or Asherah, prosperous, are they of a pure heart, for they will see Yahuwah. For he showed that a time will come in which some men will be made messengers, who in the Ruach of their mind will see Yahuwah. After these things and or after these and many similar sayings, Shimon began to assent with many oaths, saying, Concerning one thing only, render me a reason, whether the Ruach is immortal, and I will submit to your will in all things, but let it be tomorrow, for today is late, or for today it is late. When therefore Kepha began to speak, Shimon went out, and with him a very few of his associates, and that for shame. But all the rest, turning to Kepha, on bended knees, prostrated themselves before him. And some of those who were afflicted with diverse sicknesses, or invaded by demons, were healed by the prayer of Kepha, and departed rejoicing, as having obtained at once the halakha, or path, of the true Yahuwah, and also his chesed, mercy or loving kindness. When therefore the crowds had withdrawn, and only we, his attendants, remained with him, we sat down on couches placed on the ground, each one recognizing his accustomed place, and having taken food and giving thanks to Yahuwah, we went to sleep. Just one moment. 